All righty, good morning. I'm Donovan Richards, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. We're joined today by Council Members Vincent Gentili and also Council Member Dan Garodnik. Uh, we will begin uh, a public hearing on several applications today. Uh, land use items number 608 and 609, the 600, actually, we're going to skip this one, right? We're going to go to East New York, right? Or should I just? All right, so we will begin a public hearing on several applications today, land use items number 608 and 609, the 600 East 156th Street rezoning. Land use, uh, land use number 610 and 611, the Westchester Mews rezoning and pre-considered Article 11 tax exemption. And land use items number 612 and 613, the 1860 Eastern Parkway rezoning. So now we will go to... Sorry, we have to switch the order around today. We will begin our public hearing on land use items number 612 and 613, the 1860 Eastern Parkway rezoning. This application is for a rezoning from R6 and R6 uh, slash C23 to an R88 to uh, C24 overlay and designation of a mandatory inclusionary housing area in order to facilitate the development of a 10-story, 100% affordable building with 67 apartments and a community facility at 1860 Eastern Parkway. Truly Hol Holy Church, the occupant of the existing one-story building at the development site, will occupy the community facility space. The zoning text amendment would create a mandatory inclusionary housing area where options one and two would be available. The property is located in Councilmember Espinola's district, and we will now hear from Richard Lobel uh, from uh, representing Atlantic East Affiliates, LLC, Frank St. Jocks, Atlantic, Atlantic East Affiliates, LLC, and some are, I'm going to mess your last name up, so I'll just say from Heritage Architecture, Atlantic East Affiliates, LLC, as well. Okay. Thank you, Chair Richards, and thanks to the subcommittee for hearing us today. We have a very brief presentation and, of course, are available to answer any specific questions. Members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for having us. Again, Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel, PC. I'm joined by Frank St. Jacques of my firm, as well as Emily Kurtz from Ridgewood Bushwick Senior Citizens Council. And the application today is quite simply for a rezoning, which would result in the building that you see to my right, uh, this is a 10-story affordable housing building. It is fully affordable housing. Uh, it, is, uh, it is at the uh, level of option one or below. It actually reaches um, very uh, extremely low levels of affordability. And the project 1860 Eastern Parkway will be 100% um, affordable. The current occupant of the property in question is True Holy Church, which has been there for close to 20 years. Uh, the church has a 10,000 square foot church facility and pursuant to conversations with Ridgewood Bushwick as well as the Brooklyn Borough President's faith-based initiatives, the church it will now be partnering with Ridgewood Bushwick in order to develop a 10-story building. There will be 67 affordable units. The church will maintain its church space as well as certain community facility space in the ground and cellar stories and the units would be above this building. The rezoning is for a rezoning from an R6 to an R8A with a commercial overlay. Um, if you can just flip the slide and just go to the specifics of the rezoning. The rezoning itself uh, will, uh, will uh, cover only about 20,000 square feet of lot area. The site itself is 8,000 square feet. And so at the intersection of these two very wide streets at Eastern Parkway and Atlantic, uh, you have, um, you have a, a current R6 which for 100 feet to the east and west of Eastern Parkway at Long Atlantic would be rezoned to an R8A with a C24 overlay. C24, C24, C24. Correct. Um, the, uh, the actual um, uh, change as far as the land use is concerned is relatively slight here, but this will allow for uh, a building which the community board, the Brooklyn Borough President's Office, and the City Planning Commission have all found fits within the context of the surrounding area. Um, there will be various social programs offered both by Ridgewood Bushwick in the context of its operation of the building as well as True Holy Church which operates various social service programs including a food pantry which would continue out of this location. Um, the application has received uh, excellent support as we've worked our way through the hearings. 
the um, the community board in particular uh, found that this building was a welcome addition to the neighborhood. And in particular, given the fact that Atlantic Avenue and Eastern Parkway are 120 feet and 110 feet wide here, uh, really everyone along the line has felt that this intersection in particular can support the modest increase in density which would allow such a robust and um, beneficial program for Community Board 16 and the surrounding area. So again, Frank and I are here, as is Ms. Kurtz, and we'd be happy to answer any specific questions. Thank you so much and uh, really appreciate your work on this project. Can you just give a breakdown of the uh, size of the units you're doing? And you're doing 67 units, correct? Correct. We're doing 67 units. Um, <laughs> I'm Breakdown of studios. Sure. I'm joined by Summer Al Hamash, who is the project architect, and uh, I'd be happy to have her address that question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the project is consisting of 67 units, and the unit distribution is uh, at a percentage between uh, zero bedroom one, two, and three. With a, uh, distribution is really dictated by HPD standards, so we are providing about 15 percent uh, three bedrooms, and also about 15 percent zero. And the, and the balance is broken between one bedroom and two bedroom. And which program uh, are you using? Uh, have you picked the program through HPD yet? Or? We'd be using the ELLA program. The ELLA program, Correct. okay, good. Uh, tell me, what are you gonna do for parking? Well, um, there's no parking that's proposed in the building. This was a uh, thorough conversation we had with the community board. Due to the um, limitations on the site itself, uh, there's there'd be relatively little opportunity for us to place on-site parking. The idea here is that since this uh, is such a transit-rich area, there's no parking required by zoning. We're within the transit zone, and the 100% affordability of the building would allow us to waive all parking requirements. So um, despite that, the community board still felt that the overall benefits of the program and the fact that we were relatively close to the L-line and, um, and uh, a very robust bus and other subway service uh, really mitigated in favor of, of uh, allowing the project to proceed without parking. And the borough president raised concerns with the R8A. Um, he was concerned that uh, it would lead to, it would incentivize demolition and displacement of the small three unit residential buildings across Eastern Parkway. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Sure. And I'm very familiar with the area. Okay, great. The, the applicant, it's always really in the applicant's best interest to reduce the scope of the rezoning to limit the uh, the area that's devoted to the rezoning for the reason that the applicant is required to do the legal and environmental diligence required to uh, rezone a, a broader area. So city planning basically from a land use context felt that it would be um, that it wouldn't provide sufficient context to allow rezoning merely on one side of Eastern Parkway. They wanted us to mirror that on the other side. Uh, and while we understand the concerns of the Brooklyn Borough President, uh, the same arguments which mitigate in favor of uh, the increasing the density to R8A on this side of the block really hold for the other side of the block. You have a, t an intersection of two wide streets. Um, you have basically the ability here to, if it is developed in, in accordance with R8A, would be, we have, from what we understand and from conversations with a council member, at option one. So, okay. so while we don't represent those applicants and can't really speak for them to the extent that affordability uh, was set down here. It's likely that the units on both sides of the block now would be would go to lower levels of affordability, and so city planning and the uh, the community board agreed with that. And can you speak to where is the entrance of the building? So will they be flatly on mm -hmm. Atlantic or on Eastern Parkway? So so we have um, two separate entrances. You have two, okay. Uh, right, the residential is entering on Eastern Parkway. Okay. And the church is entering on Atlantic. Okay. And you don't see any, uh, con you don't have any concerns with congestion or any of that. Um, well, we the very narrow block on Atlantic. Totally understood. I mean, we, we uh, as part and parcel of every application, we have to uh, produce an environmental assessment statement. They looked at the pedestrian uses and the, the, that intersection and found that there wouldn't be any negative impacts. And any green benefits, environmental uh, benefits? Yes, so the project is designed as a passive house, which okay. is a, well, yeah, as you understand, it's a much higher mm -hmm. standard in terms of mm -hmm. energy efficiency mm -hmm. and also in terms of materials using, you know, reusable, renewable materials throughout the, the project. 
And can you speak to local hiring? How are you going to connect good jobs with the local community? So we basically, I mean, I can speak for the development team. We are, you know, putting together a hiring plan where we're going to look at uh, local MWBE firms and also hire local subcontractors throughout the booking. And do we have a percentage or goal or in mind of where we're going? Um, in terms do you want to do you want to come up? Yeah, yeah just come. Yes. Yeah, I just introduce Emily. Bring the mic a little closer. Richard Bushwick. Just stayed on the record. Good morning. I'm Emily Kurtz. I'm with the Ridgewood Bushwick Senior Citizens Council. So the percentage of MWB hiring will will be laid out for us by the funding that we have in place, which uh, well, we have an application in for 9% credits with the state. The state will provide um, our MWB goals. And in addition, HPD has recently um, implemented a new MWB program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I do want to mention that our development partners, um, Brissa, uh, Brissa Development Group is also a registered MWB mm -hmm. with, the New York, with New York State and the city. So we, um, while I don't have the percentages with me, we will be uh, paying very close attention. And Ridge Bushwick uh, does have um, job development programs that we run through our okay. social services mm -hmm. agency. And what we've started to do is to write the, uh, uh, an agreement into our, our construction contract okay. to make best efforts to hire um, through through the, our program and other local programs. And no ensure. goals on that? I'm sorry? Any goals on that? Uh, goals? We, um, again, I don't have the percentages with me, but, okay. but uh, the, without, uh, without the contractor, without the conversations with the contractor, it's hard to say, but we do push at, to the highest extent possible to hire locally um, and to support both the neighborhood and, and the programs that we're providing. Okay. Well, I'll just urge you to ensure those conversations are being had before it gets to the full land use committee so that we can have specific goals laid out, best efforts. Okay. Um, and we would love to have those things in writing. Okay. Uh, noted. Okay. All righty. Uh, we will, oh, we're joined by Council Members Torres and Wills. Any questions from my colleagues? Okay. Council Member Wills has a question. Good morning. Uh, you just stated that one of your development partners is a registered MWBE, but can you be more specific? Is it a minority? Is it just a woman? With Both, a uh, minority oh. and women. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All righty, any other questions from my colleagues? Okay, thank you so much. It's an awesome project. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right, we will go to Erica Keller. Walla and Brissa Evergreen. Um, Chair? Yes. We or actually, uh, it, it, except if there are any specific questions, we're happy to conclude with that. They, they had written, so as long as they have, yeah. they're fine? Okay. Alrighty, are there any other members of the public here who wish to testify on this issue? All right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use items number 612 and 613, and I will call a vote. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. We have to Sorry, we all messed up okay. this morning. Okay. Um, I don't want to lay out. Okay. okay, got it. So we'll be now voting on the Eastern Parkway uh, application with a modification. The modification is to remove option number two from the mandatory inclusionary housing area. The modification would allow for only option one, which is 25% of the development at an average of 60% of AMI, with 10% of the units at 40% AMI to be applied to the rezone lots. And I will now call a vote on the fi following uh, items. A recommendation to modify land use items number 612 and 613, as I described. And I also just want to note that Councilmember Espinol is in support of uh, these modifications. A yes vote is a vote in support of these recommendations, and I'll now ask the council to please call the roll. Vote to approve land use items 612 and 613 with modifications that have been described. Chair Richards. I vote aye. Councilmember Gentili. I vote aye. Councilmember Gorodnik. Aye. Councilmember Wills. Councilmember Torres. I vote aye. The vote to approve of modifications is approved by a vote of five in the affirmative, zero negatives, and zero abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee.
All right, we'll hold the vote open on this. All righty. So now we'll begin our public hearing on land use items number 608 and 609 to 600 no, East. We're going to do 610 and 611 next because Salomon is not here. Salomon is not here. All right, I will now open the public hearing. On items on land use items number 610 and 611, the Westchester Muse rezoning and the pre considered land use article 11 tax exemption. The applications are for a zoning map change that would rezone 16 lots within block 30, 3805 from, R5 with the, with the, from an R5 with a C2 2 overlay to an R6 with a C2 4 overlay commercial overlay. A zoning text amendment would create a mandatory inclusionary housing area with options 1 and 2 available. It would also amend sections 23-154 to allow increased FAR in R6 districts mapped within an MIH district and amend section 23-153 to apply the same maximum lot coverage ratio of 65% to all developments in R6 districts mapped within an MIH district. The development site consists of two vacant lots, uh, both 123 and 124, that would be redeveloped into two buildings separated by a 60-foot 60, 60 rear yard equivalent that include 206 units of affordable housing, ground floor retail, and a community facility space. The tax exemption under the private housing finance law would exempt the residential and community facility uses at the development site from real property taxes for a period of 40 years. The property is located in Councilmember Palmer's district, and we now are joined by Jordan Press, the Executive Director of Development and Planning from HPD, Peter, what's the last, Proceda from Proceda, okay, yeah. Got handwriting like me. Uh, um, Mario Proceda, Proceda Development Group uh, as well. Uh, we're joined by them. So I'll allow you to uh, make your opening statements and then we'll go from there. Hit your mic. Oh. <clears throat> good, mo good morning, Chairman, uh, Council Members, and, and Council. Uh, on behalf, uh, my name is Mario Proceda. On behalf of Proceda Development Group, we're here to present both the zoning map change amendment and the zoning text amendment for our project, which is Westchester Muse, located on Westchester Avenue at 2044 Westchester Avenue between Pugsley and Olmsted uh, in the Bronx. The map change proposed, and why don't you go to the, to the zoning map, effectively will extend a pre-existing zone change uh, from which was R6, and extend the R6 zone for the balance. Well, this doesn't work so well. There's so much for the pointer. It extends the zone, the R5, the R6 zone from what was the, which end of the site, Pete? Uh, the, from the corner of Pugsley and Westchester, uh, it extends the, the zoning from R5 to R6 for the balance of the block, as well as mapping from the corner of or from the edge of the previous rezoning to the corner of Westchester and Olmstead uh, C2-4 overlay. The rationale behind the C2-4 overlay is that this is an area well served by public transit with multiple um, parking garages on the block. Uh, therefore, the C2-4 overlay allows us to decrease the amount of parking required for commercial space um, in, in this development. Um, our development will include 206 units of affordable housing which are being developed in accordance with the mix and match program. Um, we will also be utilizing the hour space program and it's an extension of a previously completed development of 134 units of low income housing, uh, low income tax credit units uh, immediately to the uh, west of the property. To the plan. Our buildings front on both. Go to the site plan. Uh, our buildings front on both Westchester Avenue and on Newbold. In the future, bring handouts because I do, we would, have do handouts. you have handouts? I apologize. Awesome. That would Take be great. Take care of that, that right sure now. Members of the committee can actually have them. 
May continue. Okay, so we front on both Westchester and on Newbolt. Uh, we have separate building entrances on both Westchester and Newbolt in a shared courtyard in the middle of the, uh, of the development. Uh, our unit mix contains 47 studios or 23% of the units. Uh, 61 bedrooms or 32% of the units, 64 two-bedroom apartments. There's 40. There are 48 studios, 65 one-bedrooms, 57 two-bedrooms, and 35 three-bedroom apartments. The, there's 15% of the units which are uh, developed using the R space AMI level. 10% will be at 37% of AMI. 35% will be at 50. Start over again. Yes. 15% uh, will be our space. Okay. Uh, 10 so that's formerly homeless. Okay. Yes. 10% mm -hmm. will be at 40% of AMI. 50, uh, 35% will be at 57% uh, of AMI, and 40% will be at 80% of AMI. Um, the building uh, B will have 82 units and approximately 8,000 square feet of ground floor retail. This is the building that fronts on Westchester Avenue. And build, Building B, which is on Newbold Avenue, will have 124 units uh, and approximately 1,200 square feet of community facilities uh, space on the ground floor. Ground floor plan. Uh, if you flip to the ground floor plan, you'll see that we have the separate residential entrance off, uh, off of Westchester. We've got about 12,000 square feet of retail. We are currently marketing that space to uh, potential supermarkets, and we're also in discussions with the Ghetto Film School about potentially using the ground floor space as well. Uh, I think that about covers it, and we're – any questions? Uh, are you using fresh? Have you – is fresh eligible? In it, it is not a fresh eligible, it's not eligible, a fresh eligible site. Okay. Alrighty. Um, go through parking? We have no parking contemplated for the development. It's not required by the zoning. Immediately next door to the east on our Park West development, there is a parking lot. It is a public lot, although it's an accessory use lot. There's also, um, in the immediately adjacent parcel, there's another parking garage structure there as well, which is just is totally for parking. Our recent or our experience relative to parking is, has been that it is not necessary for the residential units, and it's been primarily used by the community. And community facilities just for residents in the building, or will it be uh, open to the public? It, we have not yeah. found a tenant. We have not really gone out for a tenant. That we okay. probably will have a social service provider okay. that awesome. is primarily going to be working with residents in okay. the building. Okay. Awesome. I was going to raise that question. Uh, oh. uh, we're going to go to Chair Greenfield in one second. So you're going from an R5, you said, to an R6. Yes. The, okay. Our prior development was developed with an R6 zone. There was a zone change that effectively stopped at the, proper, at the property line for the subject development. We went in to meet with city planning looking to extend the prior zone change. Uh, city planning had made the suggestion to extend the R6 over the entire block. So – not specifically just for you. So to extend – just say that again? Extend the R6 zone over the entire So block. over the entire site. Yes, they okay. felt that was a, a better approach. City, city planning's justification is that the two buildings on Newbold Avenue on the corners uh, are both currently overbuilt given their R5 zoning. Uh, once brought into the R6 zone, the build uh, – one of the two buildings will become compliant with current zoning and one will remain overbuilt. So there's really only a couple of potential development sites, which are occupied by single-family um, row houses. And go through your green space. The 
the, the park at the moment, we, we're still working on the planning for the park, and a lot of that will be contingent upon whether or not the ghetto film school comes on board, and that's still a bit fluid. Otherwise, it will be landscape, park, and garden for uh, So are you saying either or? You're going to do will either be, or? Well, no. The green space okay. will be for the quiet enjoyment of the residents okay. of the building. Okay. However, the ghetto film school, if they come in, may have some uses for for the green space as well, which would activate the space. Okay. All right, I want to go to council member. And, and HPD, can you just speak to the tax exemption? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, this pre-considered land use item is related to land use numbers 610 and 611, known as Westchester Muse, as um, uh, my uh, friends to my right have stated Westchester Muse is a proposed exemption area located at 2035 Newbold Avenue and 2044 Westchester Avenue in the Bronx in Council District 18. The developer plans to construct two buildings that will be mixed use and mixed income under HPD's mix and match program. As they testified to, the combined buildings will provide 48 studio apartments, 65 one bedrooms, 57 two bedrooms, 35 three bedroom units, as well as a two bedroom supers unit for a total of 205 rental units plus one unit for a superintendent. Building A at 2044 Westchester Avenue will be 11 stories tall and include 82 rental units. This building will include 8,090 square feet of commercial space, and Building B at 2035 Newbold Avenue will be 10 stories tall and will include 124 rental units. Building B will include 1,319 square feet of community facility space. In order to help maintain affordability of the residential units, the sponsor is seeking Article 11 tax benefits that will coincide with the regulatory agreement for a term of 40 years. Okay. And what was the rationale of, I mean, I mean, obviously I know why people like tax exemptions, but can you just speak to that a little bit more, so, why HPD is considering it for this project? Right. So the targeted household incomes, um, as they testified to, are going to be um, uh, generally very low income at 30%, 40%, 60%, and 80% of AMI. And given that um, – that, uh, How many of the units are going to be at 30% AMI? 31. 31 or about 15%? Given, given those low um, – uh, that low rental income that the property will be um, – will be taking in in order to achieve the public benefit of, of affordable housing, full property taxes would not make for a, um, a sustainable project, and the, uh, the tax exemption is, is required for project feasibility. How many other projects are you doing these tax exemptions on? Uh, considering? Ma many, many. Many, many more? Okay. Just ju – it just uh, – just uh, – Cross my mind because we have other projects that obviously come in before the committee, and I haven't seen you doing a lot of Article 11s on those projects. Yep. Um, and I'm not not yeah, no, no. I mean, you so, know, but I just want right, to know so, what is the yeah. So how do you decide? Uh, so two reasons. One is um, uh, if the project is a uh, very low income project, it can apply for um, 420C, which is uh, not discretionary. It's an as of right tax benefit. Um, and the other is um, 421A, which is now back, um, also an as of right benefit that um, uh, is often combined in these kinds of zoning actions that come before your committee. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, Chair Greenfield, who's joined us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have um, just two questions. Uh, what environmental standards is this project being built to, if any? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> it, do you mean like enterprise green communities or, or things of that nature? Yeah, lead standards or other standards. Uh, we well, are yeah. compliant with enterprise green, commu <coughs> green community standards. Okay, I mean, there are minimal standards. You're not going above. Uh, there are certain that. items that we may go beyond the green communities. We've scored above the minimum threshold, <clears throat> but that's where we, what we're being built to. Got it. Um, then just a curiosity question. What, Westchester Muse, what exactly is a Mew, and why, why is this a Mew? I Googled this, actually. I don't think this is a Mew, technically. 
I think technically a mu is a row or a street of houses or apartments that have been converted from stables or built yes. like former stables. I, Has this been, have there been stables on this property here? Uh, <laughs> maybe quite a while ago. false advertising, honestly. <laughs> I, I actually had to look this up myself when, when uh, the topic And you didn't come to the same conclusion as me? Uh, the name could use some work, but we have time to adjust that once we get to market. But there, just to be clear, there have been no stables on this location. Not to our knowledge. And you're not building it on stables or to look like stables? Uh, not at the moment. All right. I still think it's a little false advertising, honestly. But I, I appreciate your comment. I mean, because who we'll doesn't want to live? You know why everybody wants to live above stables, don't you? Do you know why? I, go ahead. Because everybody loves ponies. You never watch Seinfeld. Okay. I, I right. watch it actually all the time. I, I'll leave it. But, um, I will leave it at I, that. I think I must have missed that episode. Oh, it was one of the classic episodes, the pony episode. Okay, they're at dinner with Elaine, and the, the grandma had a pony. It really is. Wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you the clip. I, that watching. would be great. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, definitely uh, land use worthy. Um, <laughs> um, all right, thank you all. For any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I think in the age of Donald Trump, we have to make sure that when folks are putting themselves out there, making a representation, that it has to be factually correct. Can't be Saying fake. Saying it's a mu. Fake news. Can't be a face, fake muse. No okay, fake got news. It. No fake news and no, no <laughs> fake muse. <laughs> thank you all for your thank testimony. You. Uh, we will go to the next panelist, uh, Brian Brown, representing SEIU 32BJ. You may have to change that before it gets to land use, my friends. Uh, good morning, council members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Bryant Brown, and I'm here speaking on behalf of my union, the Service Employees International Union, Local 32BJ. Uh, 32BJ represents 70,000 building service workers in New York City. Over 4,000 of us live in Community District 9, where this development is proposed. I am here to tell you just how important it is that Proceda commit to creating high-quality jobs at Westchester Muse. Westchester Muse is going to create badly needed affordable housing in the Bronx. My union and I understand how important this is. Many of us have struggled to stay in New York City as rents have risen, but we also know that we need good jobs just as much as we need housing. We cannot build our way out of the affordable housing crisis. As long as there are working people earning too little to afford the rising housing costs, families are going to continue to get priced out of their homes. Building service jobs can be jobs that pay $11 an hour with no benefits, or they can be good quality jobs that pay wages that allow people to afford to put a roof over their head safe for retirement, and access health benefits. My union brothers, brothers and sisters and I have been able to stay in the city and support our families because we are lucky to have these kinds of jobs. We need to make sure that Westchester Muse is creating good jobs, not poverty jobs, for Bronx residents. This is why I'm calling on the City Council to ensure that Proceda commits to creating high-quality, family-sustaining jobs at Westchester Muse and in all of its upcoming developments across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from my colleagues? All right. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on these items? All right. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use items number 610 and 611. And we will now, and we will now move on to, sorry, we're sk sk hopping all around today. We will now move on to uh, begin our public hearing on land use items number 608 and 609, the 600 East 156th Street rezoning. The applications are for a zoning map change and zoning text amendment to facilitate the development of a surface parking lot and one-story parking garage into a mixed-use project that includes 100% affordable housing and a charter school facility. The parcel is currently zoned M1-1 for light industrial and commercial uses and is proposed to be remapped as an R8A district. A mandatory inclusionary housing area with option one would also be created. This property is located in Councilmember Salamanca's district. 
Uh, and um, he's, jo uh, he's joined us today. Do you have a statement I'm going to read? And just before I go uh, to Councilmember Salamanca, uh, before we move on to this item, just want to acknowledge Councilmember Annabelle Palmer, uh, fully supports the Westchester Muse Affordable Housing Unit at 2044 Westchester Avenue slash 2053 Newbold Avenue and wanted to put that uh, on the record as well. Proceed does not only understand the importance of providing affordable housing in my district, but they are engaged, open-minded developers who care about the welfare of the community. We have met on multiple occasions with the Land Use Division to discuss the AMI breakdown unit count bedroom, prospective retail tenants, community facility tenants, and many other specifics conducive to best serving the character and needs uh, of this neighborhood. I encourage the subcommittee zoning of, of zoning and franchises to support the application. Just want to make sure I read that in the record because she requested it. And we will now move on to Councilmember Salamanca, and then we will begin the hearing. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you, um, Chair Richards, for the opportunity to speak today regarding land use item uh, 608 and land use item 609, a development located at 600 East 156th Street in my district that is up for consideration today. Uh, in my district, just like the, the districts of many of my colleagues, the creation of affordable housing is one, is one of the most, if not the most pressing issue we hear from constituents. And every day, my office is working to assist as many individuals as possible with their housing needs. It is why I take the land use process very seriously. That's because in my mind, virtually every one of these projects has the capability to be transformative to a community if done correctly. And along with ensuring that the zoning and MIH text are right for a project, there are many other aspects that I believe must always be reviewed. That is no different from the project we are hearing today. Over the past few months, I have been in direct contact with the CEO of Phipps Houses, the developer for this project, as well as HPD, who of course is providing considerable financing. In voicing my concerns with both parties, I must say that I remain incredibly dismayed that two very important factors for this project have yet to be addressed in a way that would make me feel comfortable enough to support its approval. I'd like to put both of these concerns on the record today. First, the CEO of Phipps has not been able to assure me that the permanent jobs created through this project will be fair wage jobs with good benefits for his employees. I have heard unsettling statistics and concerns regarding low hourly wages as well as a failure to provide even basic health insurance to employees of other Phipps houses in the South Bronx. This is unacceptable, not only because it goes against what is the right thing to do, but a failure to create a, any jobs that fail to pay less than fair wage completely undermines the ability for our residents to then be able to afford the new housing we are creating. We must support fair wage jobs that provide good benefits for our working families. Secondly, I am absolutely frustrated with HPD's failure to work with me further on the affordability aspects of this project, specifically with units that will be set aside for the Our Space program for formerly homeless families. While I understand and support efforts to find permanent and affordable housing for formerly homeless families, the creation of these units cannot undermine an effort to also provide units for non-homeless families at an extremely low or very low incomes. This is a very frustrating problem that comes up for projects in my district time and time again. And I fear that we are creating a dangerous precedent in which we are working furiously to try to create housing for currently homeless families without also working to create housing for those who in essence are the most vulnerable to becoming homeless in the future those whose incomes are 30% of an AMI or below. Additionally, it is a difficult conversation to have with my constituents, many who have been on the losing end of countless HPD housing lotteries, when I have to tell them that the community preference is diluted even further due to the Our Space program. We need to address this. To close, I want to make this abundantly clear. If FIPS or HPD does not work with me to address these issues, I will not hesitate to vote against these items, specifically both land use items 608 and 609, as well as an, an impending Article 11 needing approval that I understand will be coming before the council in the coming weeks. The stakes are too important not to take this seriously. Thank you, Chair Richards, and thank you to the members of the committee for your time today. Thank you, Councilman Baselamaka. You may begin. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so we're joined by Adam Weinstein, Pip Houser, CEO, Eric Sel Sel Selzak. Felzer, okay, got here around like me too. Civic Builders, Michael Wadman, sponsor of Phipps Houses. You may begin. Hi. Thank you, uh, Chairman. State your name and who you represent. Michael Wadman, uh, Vice President of Real Estate Development at Phipps Houses, uh, the sponsor of the actions under consideration. Thank you very much for uh, meeting here today and considering our item. Uh, 600 East 156th Street is being developed by Phipps, the largest not for profit housing developer in New York. Uh, there are several other. Uh, team members who are also very experienced in this area, uh, including our affiliated property management company, architect, contractor, et cetera. Uh, we uh, propose to build an approximately 175 unit building. Uh, it will provide moderate income, very low income, and extremely low income rental housing. Uh, we're proposing to use the mix and match program, uh, which allows us to provide 80% of median as well as 30% of median income units. Uh, which are the income levels that we understand to be of most concern both to the councilman and to the community board in this area. Uh, an element of this project that we also think brings a lot of value is a charter school located on the lower two floors of the building. Uh, it's approximately 30,000 square feet. will serve K through 4, uh, approximately 450 students. Um, this is a location map. The red uh, rectangle in the middle is our site. As you can see, it's about a block from the 2-5 stop to the south. It's also uh, several blocks away from the hub uh, commercial district in this neighborhood. This is a prime area for FIPS. We have uh, approximately 2,000 housing units in this uh, general area in both community boards 1 and 3 uh, and look forward to uh, providing more housing to the residents of that area. Uh, it's another picture. This is facing south, uh, the site at East 156th. Uh, between Eagle and Caldwell. The proposed zoning action, uh, this is a leftover M11 site surrounded by residential district uh, and we are proposing to uh, upzone to an R8A with the mandatory inclusion area housing option one. That's a picture of what the building will look like. This is looking uh, east uh, up the street. The lower two floors there that you see are dark are the uh, base which is the school uh, and the housing is located above it. This is the frontage on, uh, on East 156. The awnings you see there would be the school entrance. Uh, the windows there are classrooms along that side of the building. Uh, this is an example floor plan uh, for the school. You see classrooms and a gym, combination gym cafeteria area, as well as more classrooms on the second floor. This is the residential entry, which is around the corner uh, on Caldwell, which is a residential street. Uh, total development cost here is about $85 million, $86 million, including construction costs of about $60 million. Uh, in terms of sustainable design, uh, this will be an uh, Enterprise Green Community cer Certification, but we'll also be providing uh, solar panels uh, on the roof to provide electricity. There will also be a cogeneration uh, facility uh, and some green space for tenants located on the roofs. Uh, construction employment opportunities, as always, are the primary jobs created here. Uh, we haven't selected a general contractor, but we'll work closely with them uh, for local hiring as well as minority and women-owned subcontractors. Permanent employment at the site uh, would be with Phipps's property management company as well as, as at the school, uh, and similar efforts will be made uh, in terms of those jobs. Um, a couple other items that uh, were, were questions of the previous uh, presentation, so I'll include them now. Um, affordability was something uh, talked about. It's getting a cheat sheet, my friend. Yes, there is an advantage to going third. Um, so uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the program here is mix and match. Uh, we're proposing 50% of those units to be at 80% of median income, 30% of the units to be at 50% of median income, and 20% of the units uh, to be at 30% of area median income. Uh, as Councilman Salamanca mentioned, there have been ongoing discussions about the 30% of median income units and how many of them would be uh, through the R space referral and how many of them would be through the standard lottery. Uh, FIPS is open to working out the appropriate ratio on those two items. There are financial consequences that we would have to work out as well, but um, we're not at all opposed to any particular ratio being the one that we proceed on. Um, the other questions uh, that the other groups got were about unit distribution. Uh, similarly, we have about 50, we have 15 percent three bedrooms in keeping with HPD guidelines. Uh, about 45 percent of the units are twos. Uh, about 30 percent are ones, and uh, 
a little bit more than 5% of our studios. Uh, we are most interested in providing the larger family-sized units and typically don't provide a lot of studios uh, for this kind of project. I think those were the main items that I heard previously. Um, what's that? Yeah, so I guess as, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, local hiring, we, we would be working with the contractor. We have worked with this community board previously on that issue. Um, in keeping with some of the previous questions, we haven't developed the percentage goals yet either, but I understand that's of interest in being developed soon, so we will think about that when we get before back to the office. Before it gets to the full land use committee, or before we vote it out. Understood. Yeah. Go ahead. I should mention that that's particularly important because there will be... State your name. Oh, I'm sorry, Adam Weinstein. Weinstein. Okay. Uh, Phipps Houses. <coughs> the school will have even more jobs than a normal residential building will have. Um, it's a mixed-use project, so there will be... You know, quite an opportunity. Yeah, but outside of, so I would, if yeah. you're going to say that, sort of give us on the construction side, yes. and then, yeah, we do you know, that. a separate breakdown. Yep. Um, and are you working with any local organizations to do tracking? Uh, and if not, I would recommend you work with Council Member Salamanca yeah. on the local hiring efforts. We'd be happy to do so. Okay. Um, so obviously, Councilmember Salamanca, and he'll get more in depth with this, has raised concerns about uh, the ratio of the the lower units going to homeless families, and not really his district getting consideration in here. Since we have HPD here, we're happy to have HPD here today because they don't come here often. Um, uh, has there been any consideration in chopping up the uh, fifty percent? AMI units. So there are 52 units at 50% AMI. Could we perhaps give, you know, some more subsidy dollars, perhaps, uh, towards the goal of 30 to make Councilmember Salamanca happy here? I would say on overall on the question of the unit mix and, and the AMIs, this is a, a topic that we uh, – always want to work closely with the council member and the council and the developer on to reach a right. I know that political answer. Solution. Okay. Um, so can we consider, and if you can't give a yay or nay, but I'm just giving you that to consider, you know, perhaps to make sure that, you know, while we, we definitely in this committee support housing for the homeless and we want to ensure that in any ways we can minimize the homeless crisis in New York City we want to and we want to assist the admin in doing that, but also not taking away from preservation and also uh, other efforts to ensure that local residents would have access to better quality housing in these neighborhoods too. So am I making sense here? So if there's ways to make sure we can get to both, that would be awesome here. We would agree. Okay. We would agree that it would be awesome to get to both of those goals, and and our, I would say are, are, are working hard in, in this district and others around the city to bring um, housing in a mix of different incomes while uh, trying to solve um, this tremendous crisis of homelessness that we have in the city. And are there any other M1 districts in the vicinity here that we're going to look – okay. So this particular area was vacant, I'm assuming, or – there, there had been a <coughs> – Were there any manufacturing use on this there and a parking operator for some time. Uh, the business – excuse me <coughs> – the business owner also owned the site and was interested in relocating and selling the site. The business owner who previously – no problem. Let's get you some water. That's the greatest water in New York City, by the way. Uh, it's the coldest water, certainly. Um, it is ice cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, the, the previous owner had uh, run a very small business there for quite a while and decided they were ready to leave and sell the site. Um, and so uh, we bought the property from them. They vacated shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, basically, as I said, it's surrounded by residentially zoned property. So this was really a holdover from quite a while ago. And what's the timeline of the school uh, yeah, so being the operable? Yeah, so the development uh, – Obviously, uh, subject to working out the issues that have been mentioned today and receiving the rezoning approval, we want to close the financing in December of this year. Um, it'll be approximately two years of construction to complete both the school and the housing. 
with the goal of delivering uh, the housing, sorry, the school in the middle of, um, sorry, that would be 2020, given the construction schedule. So the school would be open <coughs> in 2020? Correct, the fall. Operable, year. like children Correct. in it. Okay. Yes. All right, I'll go to Councilmember Salamanca now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do not have many questions because we have been speaking and negotiating, and um, it was important for me to make this statement on the record uh, so that the um, everyone understands my concerns and what my position is um, on the record. Um, again, um, that, you know, don't want to be the dead horse. HPD, you understand my position on the hour space. Uh, my community is in dire need of low-income units, and that's what I fight for, 30% AMI. And why I understand the, the homeless crisis in the city of New York, you know, my community is overburdened with homeless shelters. Uh, I have 27 homeless shelters in my council district, over 460 cluster sites in my council district, which I'm working with the administration to try to reduce those numbers. And why I understand that homeless families need permanent housing, I have low-income families in my council district who have fought day in and day out to ensure that they don't, they, they, that they, they don't, they're not part of the DHS system. And when we're bringing in units to our council district, I need to ensure that I protect these low-income units so that they have access to them. And this Our Space program, while historically we have, you know, my prior life as a district manager, and HPD would come with projects, it was 5% set aside for homeless families. And now HPD is proposing a new term sheet and is increasing that our space program to 10%. I cannot support that because I need to protect as many units as possible for my low-income low families. Um, in terms of the ULIP process, um, you know, I have concerns and something that I want to warn my colleagues. Um, a few months ago, we approved in this body we approved the ULIP for Concourse Village West, where there was a certain amount of units uh, and unit sizes that were approved. Uh, after that ULIP was approved, they came back for an Article 11. And in that time frame, I did, I did not know that they can do this, they changed the amount of unit counts that was originally approved in the ULIP. And so there's a lack of trust here from my office with HPD, and I think that we need to continue to have these conversations, and that is why I am requesting moving forward that all ULERPs and all Article 11s, when we agree on something, it is written on the resolution uh, to ensure that these changes do not occur um, without notice. And then finally, um, again, um, the wages, um, FIPS, Adam, um, you know, these workers who are, these employees who are working in your buildings are my constituents. I think it's unfair for employees in my council district to be getting paid 10 to $12 an hour, okay? And, and uh, if they want health insurance for their families, we're talking about up to $800 a month. Uh, they cannot afford that. And so it is my responsibility to protect their rights, and that's what I'm doing so now. I'm going to speak to that. I would, and I agree with the council member um, completely. These are our employees, and we're a long-term employer and large employer in the Bronx and have, I think, a track record of success being a employer who cares about um, employees, irrespective of membership in a union. And providing a uh, fair wage and providing benefits is essential to us. I am, uh, for the record, um, I, I, so I completely agree on the record with the council member. Um, I question some of the, the data that you've been shared. I, I'm, we employ 108 maintenance workers and 36 superintendents. Of those, um, 36 are, are not members of a union. Doesn't matter. We pay what is the fair wage standard, the, the relevant new hire rate, for that employee, irrespective of their joining a union or not. We p supply benefits, which the very same benefits I get. Um, we supply retirement benefits in the form of a pension and a 401k. We have two locations, um, and I think the council members are aware of them, both in your district, one of which is represented by a union, the other has been organized by a union now, at which we have two employees by virtue of the fact that one of their timing, two employees, 
who are paid, one is paid $12 an hour and one is paid slightly less than $12 an hour. And it is purely an accident of those two contracts. Those two, we, as you well know, we can't raise rates when union activity is taking place at a location. So this poor gentleman, you know, unfortunately couldn't get the raise. I'm sure it will be dealt with in the union negotiation that takes place subsequently. And in the second location, the union is negotiating with the employer right now. So I am, I am very confident that both of those situations will be rectified. And with regard to benefits, um, in, in those two instances, we hired maintenance companies in, um, to, because we couldn't staff up those large buildings fast enough. We're, we won't do that again. We've terminated the maintenance company at one of the locations, and I think it's very likely we'll terminate them at the other location. If uh, question from Councilmember Wills, followed by Greenfield. We've also been joined by Councilmembers William and Levin. So I basically, oh, sorry. And Palmer. So I basically had the same questions that um, Councilmember Salamanca ver, uh, expressed already, and you've <coughs> answered it. Um, I would just strongly encourage you to continue to work with them diligently, and uh, HBD also. You've done a lot of good work. We're working on you with a few projects in my district. So we, we will be watching it because um, we support the other members. And he has some really valid points. Um, I appreciate the fact that you put on the record that you look out for workers, no matter they're part of union or non-union. Uh, but again, I strongly encourage you to work with Salamanca on this. Uh, Councilmember Greenfield. Chair Greenfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So, Jordan, how are you? I'm excellent and brushing up on my Seinfeld trivia while I sit here. <laughs> For the record, the Pony episode is certainly one of the best episodes in Seinfeld. We're going to we, we might have to have a showing uh, within the Land Use Committee just so people can appreciate the uh, historic significance of that episode. Let me ask you this question regarding regarding the, um, the challenge that we have here today, and I really want to understand the position of, of HPD. So the, the Our Space Initiative, I think that's what you guys call it, initiative, right? Essentially, what you're doing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're providing a deeper or better subsidy for the developer to utilize the Our Space Initiative for what essentially would be the same AMI level. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So to Chair Salamanca's point, this, there's actually a bigger public policy question over here, and it's not simply one that's just applying to his project, which is essentially you're disincentivizing developers from building traditional low-income 30 percent AMI units, and instead you're incentivizing them to build units for formerly homeless. It's a pretty significant policy shift. When did you folks decide to do that? How did you make that announcement? What consultation did you have with the city council? And let's talk about the practical implications. 30% AMI is the lowest AMI level. Have you considered that you're now taking housing away from folks who are on the verge of becoming homeless? And you're sort of putting those folks, which in this case happens to be Chair Salamanca's constituents, at the back of the line, right? Because now you're prioritizing folks who are currently homeless as opposed to the folks who are literally about to be homeless. In no particular order, do you have to answer those questions? So, yeah, so I, I actually don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because in the coming days we are uh, going to be releasing a new term sheet uh, that um, – changes all of our subsidy levels um, across the ELLA and the mix-and-match programs um, and, and brings a little bit more uh, equal treatment to those. I'd, I'd uh, be happy to uh, brief you and all the other members of the committee uh, offline on those since they're not quite out the door yet. But let me, let me mention one important Point. Okay, so to, to be fair, Jordan, I don't want to focus on the future. I want to focus on this project. So let's okay. just talk about – I'm more than happy to have the bigger policy conversation, but the reality is that the policies that you've made have impacted this project. But for your Our Space initiative, there, th this would be a traditional ELLA 30 percent AMI, and, and you've now skewed it in favor of, of currently homeless as opposed to folks who are on the edge of being homeless, that's a legitimate concern that the chair has. 
let me say one thing, and then and then I'll pass it off to the to the developer. First of all, um, this project is going to be closing after our new term sheets are in place, and we will be applying the standards of those new term sheets to this project. Um, those new term sheets will include the new term sheets that we don't yet have or are aware of at the hearing that we're having today about this project. No, Jordan, I just want to be fair. I mean, fair is fair. It's not fair to say, you know, trust us, we'll get back to you in a couple of weeks on some new term sheets. So we've, we've briefed council staff on, on the term sheets, and I look forward to speaking with you uh, directly about them. But those will include a 10% requirement of our space units across all ELLA and mix and match uh, projects regardless of district and borough. Um, speaking to the concern that um, there's a concentration in this district or any other district where where we bring these projects, we are going to make that a, a standard across all of our L and mix and match. Great. So just to be fair, I just want to actually have a conversation about this. So essentially what you're, what HPD is deciding is you're giving a preference you're, you're giving a preference, right, that's a big policy shift. You're giving a preference to currently homeless folks as opposed to folks who live in districts who I think we could all agree are marginal and may, in fact, be homeless, right? And I think that's really the point that Chair Salamanca is making, which is you're taking away the housing from those folks who live in his district who are literally on the brink in in favor of folks who are currently homeless. It's a policy decision that you're making. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just trying to understand that. It's a pretty big deal. So we should... Yeah, but in fairness, yeah. this, this project has an excellent mix of, of AMIs um, all, on the, all on the lower end that um, are going to be available. Half of those will be available under our standard community preference to residents of the district. Um, no, but Jordan, in fairness, we're talking about the lowest... AMI, right? And the lowest AMI is always, as you know, and this committee knows, and the chair can certainly tell you, that's our biggest struggle is always to get the lowest AMI. And essentially, you're taking some of those lowest AMI units off the market by, A, currently incentivizing developers to do that, and B, what you're saying is you're going to be making that an official policy where you have to do that. That's a very significant shift. What about the concern that council members like Chair Salamanca have where that shift is going to disadvantage local communities where folks have been waiting for years to try to get some sort of affordable housing. And to the chair's point, they finally feel like they can get this super low affordable housing. And then, boom, HPD comes in and says, sorry, folks, we're taking away a large portion of that. And instead, we're giving it to folks who are currently homeless. So you folks who have hung in there, and you've tried your best, and you paid your rent, and you struggled every month, and you almost you saw the light at the end of the tunnel we're taking that away from you. That you can understand why that's pretty frustrating. Well, I, st I, I still believe, you know, at 10% at of the total units, uh, given the crisis facing the city, I... 10% of the total units, to be fair, Jordan, is a much larger percentage of the 30% AMI units, right? I mean, so I, I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to quibble, okay. I don't want to, uh, you know, get into one of these verbal uh, spats. I think you understand what I'm, what I'm I, getting at over I here. Understand. There is a big policy question that has been raised by this, and we've heard this in the past, and I think it's something that we have to discuss in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, going forward. You heard the chair was very clear about this particular project, that if there are not changes, he's not going to support the project, and I certainly support his position. I think we need to have a conversation about that balance. I understand what it is that you're seeking uh, to do, but at the same time, there are folks in these districts who have struggled and have barely held on, and they finally see a new project coming, and then you're taking away those very low income or extremely low income, to use the term that you guys use, units in favor of folks who are currently homeless as opposed to folks who are about or potentially may go homeless. I think that's a legitimate policy question that we can disagree on or certainly engage in a more robust conversation on. Wouldn't you agree, I, Jordan? I, I would look forward to those um, ongoing conversations with, okay. with you and the council. I, I, I just want to ask the developer, I know th they want to make a, a point about how they viewed perhaps our yeah, subsidies I guess the, and, the, and the mix. Just re returning to the project at hand uh, for a moment, um, you know, we, we have indicated to both HPD and the councilman that we're uh, more than willing to have 30 percent of median units that are not our space. The band at that income level in a standard ELA project is 10%. Uh, we've already indicated we would provide that same band within this project. 
Um, we would like to provide some R space units in addition, you know, that would not be. So of the units would be at 30 percent of median and subject for to local residents. Correct. Okay. Um, and then uh, the R space band would be some number of units subject to this. Is that 10 percent too? Because I see 20 percent of the total units. So yeah, 30, so. of that 20 percent, uh, at least half of those uh, could be lottery units. Is what we've already said. And the rest, some number up to the rest, depending on this conversation. I mean, we're relatively value neutral on what that ratio is, and this is obviously a conversation that's that's bigger than this project and me. Uh, but I did want to make that point that we are providing already the same amount that would be done under standard ELLA, and then the rest of the income mix here is, uh, you know, we think is very in keeping with what with what the community has has asked for. So th those are only the only points I wanted to make about our specific project and that we are willing is, to Is it fair to say that you're encouraged to use the Our Space Initiative because of the considerable subsidy that you're getting from HPD as a result? So there, there are a couple things related to that. Uh, now, let's just be clear. If there was no subsidy, you'd still use, you still would do the additional Our Space units? Uh, so, so the Our Space units really don't serve exactly the same income band. Th that is the income maximum. But the incomes of people coming out of shelters for those units are not 30 percent of median income units. They're much lower than that. And the rents that uh, one can charge to that population is strict shelter rent, which is much lower than the 30 percent of AMI median rent. So it's not fair to treat those as completely interchangeably. It is true that the subsidy is deeper for those units that are at an even lower rent. I understand that. And My without, question, though, without is without those subsidies, you wouldn't be doing it. That is true of all these income bands. You know, you need more subsidy to provide deeper affordability. So <laughs> HPD's mix and match does a very straight mathematical set of options. If you do 30 percent of median, you get this amount. If you do 40, you get this, you know, et cetera. Now I have to let my boss talk. Well, no, I, I just want to maybe clarify the 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 important point is that the rent would be lower and thus the ability to carry first mortgage debt is lower. And so what the subsidy in effect does is offset that loss between the homeless unit partially. It's not fair to say it, it doesn't, there isn't a little bit of incentive. I think you're, you're, the chair is correct. The, the, um, but it, it's not as enormous a subsidy as you would think because you lose project sources, sources of funding for the project I understand. My point, the point that I'm making is that the HPD has broad power in terms of how they would like to see projects work, and they do that by essentially providing you with the term sheets and the subsidies. And when they provide subsidies for one ban, or in this particular case, uh, one, uh, one project, uh, or specifically for the Our Space Initiative, that are deeper than other subsidies, when you look at those numbers, it all factors in when you're trying to crunch your numbers, and you say, okay, well, this makes financial sense for us. And while you're certainly an affordable housing developer and you care about affordable housing as well, you also care about financing your projects and making sure that they're economically sustainable, right? And so my point is that HPD has made a decision to subsidize these our space units even further than other traditional units, and by default, they're incentivizing these and disincentivizing the others. And I'm not saying that's wrong necessarily. All I'm saying is that we need to have a robust conversation about that, and this isn't directed at you, the developer. It's directed at my very dear friends at HPD. We need to have a robust conversation about the implications of making such a citywide decision, which is to say that we are now saying that we are placing a preference over homeless housing over those folks who are on the cusp of being homeless. And that's a legitimate public policy debate, and I'm just flagging that because I'm just expounding on what Chair Salamanca's frustrations are. Thank you very much. Uh, Jordan, so on formerly homeless on, on, on the program, so we've been hearing policy shifts or proposals from the admin on homelessness. So I'm, I'm anxious to know, so are you prioritizing, and I think one way to certainly work with communities as this policy shift happens, which is a good policy. So no one's debating that. I think that we need to address more homelessness in our, in our city and within the housing we're building. Are you prioritizing people who are formerly homeless from these neighborhoods? I'm really glad you asked that question. Okay. Um, the, and 
And so, so what I'm getting at is if you were homeless from this neighborhood, now are you able to come back? Exactly. And yeah. okay. yes, I'm really glad you asked that question. Uh, not speaking for the Department of Homeless Services who issues these referrals, um, but I'll say that um, I know that they make an effort, Department of Homeless Services, when they make referrals, makes an effort to place residents in the community where they wish to live going forward. Oftentimes, and this is anecdotal, but oftentimes we understand that people want to live in the community from which they came from. Um, and it is natural to assume that there is some connection between the placements that will occur uh, by DHS referral into these units that, you know, some percentage, perhaps a healthy percentage, would be from uh, residents from that district. And, and, and in that way, you are addressing the homelessness crisis of residents in that district. Um, you said the assumptions. And assumption means assumption, right? Um, so can we get definitive, and I know there's fair housing yep. concerns and yep. those sort of things that... Uh, again, uh, as, I, as I stated, it is probably... Um, you know, but how, so DHS is, would work with the developer or work directly with you or how no, does that... So DHS works with, with uh, the shelter residents right. to place them into the neighborhoods where they wish to live. Uh, you say because I, that has not been our experience in the council. But if you're saying okay. moving forward, this is going to happen. So and, I'm just interested and, in knowing yeah. are, we, are we really shifting to that policy? Yeah, and I, I, I would actually, as we delve into this a little bit further, feel much more comfortable having this conversation with DHS at the table. So, I'd, I'd so I would suggest that um, perhaps, you know, the chair should be briefed on this certainly Absolutely. Um, with HPD because obviously a lot of these projects are going to come before the subcommittee. Um, and land use and, and council member Salamanca's committee, um, and then perhaps a briefing for the council on this as well, so that sure. everyone is up to speed on this. So when these land use projects come before us, we're well versed on it and, and know what to expect. But and once again, I think it's a good thing. I think attaching these things to Ella and Nixon Match and other programs is a great thing, quite frankly. Thank you. But. We want to make sure there's science around it as well. Yep. All right, I'm going to go to Councilmember Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was chairing another hearing, so I couldn't be here uh, sooner, but I was listening to the conversation. Um, one, I just want to uh, say it's just good to hear this. Sounds like two kind of policy shifts that are happening, uh, which I've been screaming about for some time. Uh, one is I'm just happy to hear homelessness and housing being discussed at the same time. Uh, we very often have those discussions separately, which is a frustrating thing. And two is uh, that we're now mandating uh, these certain types of housing uh, across um, across projects and across uh, whether it's Ella mix and match, no matter where they are. That's a concept that seemed to have eluded uh, this body and the administration when we did MIH. So hopefully one day somebody can explain why we can do it now, what we can do with MIH. We're suffering the consequences of that. Uh, but I guess it's better late than never. Um, my hope is one day we'll look at MIH and change that and use the same concept that you're using now that we see is correct and apply it to MIH so we don't have to suffer through um, continual same discussions. Um, but I also want to say I do understand uh, uh, Councilmember Salamanca's uh, frustration and hopefully it can be some more discussion about I don't think he's opposed to giving up any percentage uh, to folks in, uh, who are homeless. I think he just wants to have an, an additional discussion, and uh, my hope is that that discussion uh, will continue. And I have received some of the term sheet information. I'm waiting to read it through and get briefed. Um, I do like what I'm hearing, but I want to make sure that the discussion continues with all of the council, and it's not just the administration um, having a solitary conversation uh, and then uh, making a decision. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Any other questions? All right, we're going to open. Okay, uh, we'll close. Uh, th thank you. Uh, we'll have the next panel come up. Eric Selson, I believe. Felsen, Civic Builders. So I think, unless there were questions about the charter school specifically, Eric would need Any to questions speak. on the school? I had one quick question on the school. So, can you just explain they're a charter school developer, or this is a charter school? an actual charter school, how does, 
How does the economics work on that? Can you just sort of give us the basics of what exactly uh, that is? Is there a specific charter school that's going to go into the site? Or do you are you sort of sort of a broker for charter schools? And I couldn't really understand that in terms of how that works. Um, so my name is Eric Felzak with Civic Builders. Uh, Civic Builders is a uh, nonprofit real estate development group for charter schools. Um, okay. We are currently working with BIPs to um, design and help finance the community facility space for for a specific charter school in mind, um, which happens to be uh, Berea Charter School. Say it again. Can you speak? Can you speak? In you the can pull mic? the mic a little closer. Yeah. The mic moves. You don't have to move the chair. It's easier. I there can you do go. both. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so we're currently working with Berea Charter School, um, okay. which is uh, in the South Bronx. Um, and we have a term sheet with them. They're sort of uh, in agreement with us that they'll take this. And so basically, based on the fact that they're going to pay rent, mm -hmm. they're going to pay rent based on the rent that they get paid for by the city of New York, that you work that out through them, and you're the folks who are developing it in a certain sense, you're what? You're purchasing it or it's sort of a condo or what does that look like? Is it, a, is it a condo with FIPS or how does that, what does that structure actually look like? Hi, uh, Michael Wadman from FIPS again. So the structure here is actually a lease, uh, it's a master lease to Civic Builders. Silver Civic Builders really performs the real estate development function and then they lease it to the operator. We've been working together to design the space to make sure that it works for their for their operator, and they would pay uh, basically a below market kind of uh, community facility level rent to us for the life of the project. Got it. And then you, Civic, you then go and lease it to a charter school. Correct. Okay. And this charter school has already been approved. Correct. And they currently have a location, and they're moving here, or it's a new school. Um, so. They're currently operating um, in the South Bronx, and once this project is complete, uh, they'll be moving their operations here. Got it. So how far are they currently from this site? It's about a mile and a half. It's in the Mott Haven neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this assumes their expansion needs as well, I presume. Correct. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Councilman of Salamanca. Um, question about the charter school. Um, we haven't met yet. Um, how many charter schools are, are are you? Is your organization, your company, contracted with FIPS throughout the city of New York? Uh, this is our first uh, partnership with the FIPS. Okay. Yep. All right. And so you are currently open in the Mount Haven district. I take it that's the speakers district that you're in. Right. So I, I am not with the charter school. I am with Civic Builders, not Bria. Um, Bria is the actual charter school. We are the developer. All right. Um, so, Phipps, it's important that I meet with the charter school that is, uh, is proposing to come uh, to this facility. I, I've already instructed my team. Um, no has has this charter school met with the local community board, and and they've gotten a letter of support? Um, so, so I have attended uh, local community board meetings um, with Phipps uh, to to field questions on behalf of the charter school and to uh, to hear the concerns of the, the community. We have not received a, uh, a letter of support. All right, so I think it's important that this charter school, if they're operating in Mount Haven, they're in Community Board 1, they should have a conversation with the community board and get a letter of support. And how, how long has this charter school existed in the Mount Haven area? Um, f for about two, two years, I believe. Yeah, I, I think that immediately after this hearing, you should reach out to the charter school, and we should have a joint meeting with Community Board 1 in my office. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we'll call the next panel, 32BJ, Sean Cromwell, Marcos Murillo, Suzanne Kahn, for Gustavo. Oh, it's Gustavo. Oh. SEIU 32BJ. We're going to vote next. Yes. Written testimony will submit.
righty, you may state your name and begin. Good morning, my name is Sharon Cromwell. I'm the new development lead at SEIU 32BJ, um, and we are here to t today to call attention to the issues at Phipps Houses Developments and to ask the council to oppose the development at 600 East 156th Street. Um, whenever we come to, whenever we get involved in ULERPS, whenever we come before this body, we are very consistently calling for affordable housing and for good jobs. Um, we, we insist that affordable housing does not have to come at the expense at good building service jobs, and we believe that housing should mean good jobs because we know addressing the affordable housing crisis and addressing the income inequality crisis calls for both of those, both of those things to be done. Um, for years, FIPS has seemed to recognize this, and 32BJ considered FIPS a partner in ensuring that working conditions met the industry standard that 32BJ members have fought hard for and won and set throughout the city and set throughout the Bronx. Um, you know, 32 BJ members in 13 of Phipps's older buildings are in family sustaining wet wages and high quality health insur insurance and retirement benefits. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case, and there's workers in one of Phipps's newer developments that are struggling to get by. So that development is Cortland Corners, where workers at the building who have been at the building for three years are receiving wages below $12 an hour, and at this point, many have only received a single raise in that three-year time period. The, these workers and their families are surviving on roughly 30 to 40 percent AMI. Um, so while the contractor at Cortland Corners technically offered workers health insurance, the plan cost was a minimum of $100 per month for individual insurance or $916 per month for family insurance, which is about half of the employee's gross income. So as a result, at least three of the 13 workers at the complex rely on Medicaid for health insurance, and the majority of the rest are using subsidies to buy their own insurance on the New York State Health Insurance Exchange. exchange. Um, you know, these, these conditions and these standards are in stark contrast to other industry standards where workers are receiving family health insurance fully paid by the employer. We think that FIPS can do better in the Bronx. Um, we don't want to be in the position where we're calling on a project like this to not be moving forward. We strongly believe that new affordable housing needs to be built. But we also know that we need to create good jobs, and that's why we're here today. Um, community sorry, the community board recommended that this project only move forward if the developer committed to a local hiring plan, and as well as ensuring good jobs for building service workers. That just hasn't been done yet, and so that's why we're calling for this project not to move forward. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I go to testimony um, in opposition to the proposed rezoning of East. Just state your name for the record as well. M my name is Marcos Morillo. Gracias. I, I go to testify in opposition to the proposed rezoning of East. 156th Street Zoning and Franchise Committee, May 2nd, 2000, 2017. Good morning. My name is Marcos Morillo. I am a Bronx resident, a building super, and SEIU 32BJ union member. 32BJ members maintain, clean, and provide security service in residential buildings all across the five boroughs including one like the proposed development at 600 East 156th Street. Through our job, we receive as access to high quality health care and can save for retirement. I believe that all workers in New York should have the same opportunity. That is why I am here today opposing the proposed rezoning on 156th Street. The way workers are treat, treated at fifth building across the city varies significantly. In a number of its existing property, FIPS has created high quality building service jobs for workers like me. At these buildings, FIPS ensures supers, porters, and handy persons with family sustaining salary, good health, and retirement benefit. But at other fifth building, building service workers report 
making wage well below the area standard while receiving no meaningful benefit. I know how hard it is for working people to make it in this city. As housing price have risen, my union brother and sister have a struggle to stay in their home. Thanks to our union job, we are able to do that. But I can imagine how I will be able to keep my family here if I have to pay out of my pocket for her insurance. I definitely would not be able to save for retirement. 32 BJ members know how important it is that affordable housing developer can build in our city. But it's not helpful if the job they created add to the housing crisis instead of helping to solve it. We want to work with FIPS and others developers to make sure that employment practice at, that, at their buildings help fuel the mission instead of undermining it. But if developers aren't committed to this, we don't think the council should support their projects. Thank you. Thank you, sir. State your name for the record as well. My name is Suzanne Kahn, and I'm actually here delivering testimony on behalf of Gustavo Battle, who is a building service worker at Phipps House's Cortland Corners Complex in the Bronx. He really wanted to be here today to tell you about his experience, but unfortunately this time doesn't work for him because he has a job. Um, so I'm just going to read what he had to say on his behalf. I have been working at Cortland Corners since August 2013. When I was hired by Phipps' contractor at Cortland Corners, my salary was $11.50 an hour. After a year, it went up to $11.79 an hour, and since 2014, it has stayed there. So this isn't a re recent issue. My wages have been stuck in the same place for three years. As we all know, the cost of living has gone up in that time, so it has gotten harder and harder for me to make ends meet. My coworkers and I have struggled to get by on our salary. Many of us rely on Medicaid for health insurance because the insurance our employer offered was far too expensive on our salaries. We work in one of Phipps House's affordable housing complexes, and we cannot afford to rent the majority of the units in the building where we work. One of my coworkers has lived in a shelter with his daughters for the last three years. Over the past year, at hearings like this, Phipps has said repeatedly that the time to discuss workers' rights is after a development is built. I am here to say that waiting until then is too late for the workers like me, who could well be hired at poverty wages and have to spend years fighting to increase their pay. Phipps Houses has a stated mission of helping the people of New York City build healthy, prosperous communities, but I am part of the community, and Phipps has done nothing to make sure that I can prosper. I believe this committee should vote no on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions from Councilman Basella Monco. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your statements. Um, I have a few questions uh, just to get some clarity here. Um, in, in, in your statement, you mentioned that uh, FIPS is being inconsistent in terms of salary wages and benefits in certain buildings. Um, it seems that they are paying these fair wages and their benefits are being provided. Um, and, but it seems that in some, in some other buildings, such as the ones in my district, they are getting low wages and they obviously their health insurance is far, is far above what the employees can, um, can actually afford. Can you explain the inconsistency and why? I can start off on that, and then maybe Suzanne can jump in. I, like I said, we've had a long-standing relationship with Phipps Houses, um, and there, I think you know Adam Weinstein has said this before, but they have ha they have a lot of buildings in their portfolio that are union, where they are paying good wages and they are paying um, good benefits. Um, and we, you know, recently looked through their portfolio and saw that over the past decade or more, they've actually not been 
paying at that at that the wage rate and more importantly I think and where, where there's an actual big divergence is the benefits um, and so when we were talking to workers at Cortland Corners this is what we found out that they are being offered an insurance package that is just way beyond what they can afford um, and why we're here is because we want to merge that so that there is a, a uniform standard that uh, workers are experiencing when they're working in in FIPS buildings and we don't think that divergence has to exist um, anyone else want to answer I think you I think you covered it we can provide the actual numbers though All right. um, my other question is in Corlin Corners uh, there are 13 employees there correct I believe that's the out of the 13 how many actually have health insurance I don't want to give you a number that isn't correct. I know that we have talked to three who are receiving Medicaid. We can do the breakdown but between who's you. receiving Medicaid, yeah, who's buying on the exchange, and who's if anyone's getting it from the from the contractor, the employer provided one. All right. Um, um, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's it for now. Thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? All right. Seeing none, we're going to close this down. Anyone else want to testify on this item? All righty, seeing none, I will close public hearing. This is 612 and 613, right? No, no. 608 and 609. We will close public hearing on uh, land use item 608 and 609. Uh, and we will now uh, call the vote again uh, a recommendation to modify. Land use items number 612 and 613, and uh, East New York and Council Member Salamanca from Espinola's district, and he's in support. Uh, and we'll call, now, Council will now call the roll. Council Member Williams, vote to approve 612 and 613 with modifications. I just want to say congratulations to Council Member Espinal. I'm delighted to vote on a uh, modification uh, that will amend the MIH uh, to get to uh, the lower AMI. So I vote aye. The vote to approve 612 and 613 with modifications is approved by a vote of six in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, and re referred to the full land use committee. All righty. Thank you. Thank you all for a very exciting hearing today. All righty, so we'll be laying over uh, item 600, uh, laying over the 600 East 156th Street application and the Westchester Muse application uh, for consideration. With that being said, this hearing is now closed.